Uh, we, we had the absolute pleasure of working with Ricky in a camp situation in Mercia last February. Uh, and what I do want to say before Ricky starts is that the, before, the performance behaviours that Ricky encouraged and, uh, and developed in during that just that few days that we were like, a few days, how long were we there? Yeah, that was seven oh, no, days. I was seven only, days. Yeah, you were there days. a full week, yeah, and some of the athletes were there 10 days. Um, but yeah, there was a, a lot of, a lot of um, performance behaviours established in that the athletes were required to monitor themselves on a day by day basis. And I just think, we just all learned so much, which then carried on through, um, and this is what we are, you know, we're trying to encourage. Um, <coughs> so yeah, it was great to work with Ricky, and then and then since then, you know, he's, he's now working with athletics in the institute, um, so monitoring our athletes, um, doing the lab tests when needed, doing field tests when needed, and I'll let Ricky say the rest. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Yeah, it's just um, again, just give us an overview of what I've done. With, uh, what I've been doing with the Flag I guys, uh, mainly focused on um, endurance sports, so from 1500 metres up to marathon, marathoners. Okay, so these are just basically applied experiences, and I'm just going to start off just a general overview. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, what, what the rationale is for athlete profiling, why do you need to profile your athletes? Um, Steve touched upon it earlier on in his, uh, his lecture earlier. And also the importance then of um, off the back of athlete profiling, how you then prescribe your training and your training zones for the athletes. And then also once you've prescribed that training, how do you monitor the training? Okay, so and the importance of monitoring the training load and we'll go into more detail um, throughout the presentation. So <coughs> what are the um, what's the rationale for profiling, especially in the lab where you can have control the environment. See, so it's the talk that you can control that environment rather than do it in a field based um, area. In the lab, then, what we can do is analyze the key determinants of endurance. Now, I'm just going to talk through the, the main key in your, uh, determinants of endurance. Basically, the likes of your view to max or your view to peak, your um, run economy, your O2 kinetics, your speed at lactic threshold, and your speed at lactic turn point as well as your fractional utilisation. So all those key determinants that um, determine positive performances in your athletes are crucial to identify them where they land the spectrum in regards to their physiological strengths and weaknesses. They might have a high VO2 peak, but they might have a low run economy. Why is that? Can we then um, work in that weakness to improve that athlete in a physiological uh, manner of speaking? It also then allows us to provide a benchmark in comparison to other athletes. There's a lot of literature out there in the um, in research in journal scientific journals of um, categorizations of VO2 matches for elite athletes, late marathon runners, 75 to 85 milliliters per minute per kilogram, um, run on economies less than 185, less than 170. Again, allows us to provide a benchmark where our athletes sit in relation to world champions or record holders. <coughs> and also then, throughout the, the, the profiling process, it can then um, enable the physiologist and the coach to potentially predict, predict potential performance capability. So based off your lactate threshold, it's been well researched that your, lactate, your speed at lactate threshold can give you a good indication of your marathon time, and your speed at lactate turn point can give a good indication of your, your 10k, 10. Okay, so well, I'm just going to go through the brief um, protocol that we're going to carry out with Kira uh, later on. It's basically we'll use the treadmill in the lab. Uh, it's just down at the, if anybody doesn't know where it is, it's just down at the reception area at the back of the University of Sports Centre. Reception. Sorry. Yes, morning guys, don't worry, just no problems. Uh, what we're going to utilise in this case with Kira, we're going to go three minute stages at a half a percent incline and then we're going to, at the end of each stage we're going to record blood lactate, heart rate and uh, an RPE for each stage. Throughout the test we are going to then um, analyse Kira's VO2 intake. So we are, um, basically that will allow us to identify other determinants of endurance rather than just um, uh, blood markers. 
and then at the end of each stage we're going to increase the pace by one kilometer an hour, right up until it's basically not until she falls off the treadmill, but until she gets um, until she really goes to 18, 19, 20 in the RP skill. Come on in, guys, don't be worried. Okay. Ricky, I'm actually jumped the gun a little bit. Apologies, guys. I, I don't think I've realised your session hasn't finished. I'm just about to start. Yep. But you've not, not, you're not missing too, too much. I haven't missed too much. No. <laughs> You'll be thankful that you've missed So, again, <coughs> when we're in the lab, um, and this is a, a real life um, uh, result of a PXT test by one of our top marathon numbers. <coughs> when we're in the lab, basically what we're looking to do is identify your heart rate and your blood lactate response to increasing exercise um, intensity, increasing exercise and load. But again, this particular athlete started at 15 k an hour and then we progressed right up to 22 kilometers an hour. And what we're looking for is individual lactate deflection points within that curve. So we are and we can see here what we normally use is a, 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 a our determinant's lactate threshold is a change in blood lactate levels, not 0.4 millimole above resting baseline levels. Okay, so we can see here 15, 16 kilometers an hour, 17 kilometers an hour, everything's all okay. Baseline levels 50, 18 kilometers an hour. There's just a slight jump. So that tells us around about this time, around about this, these paces. Is where his LT is, his LT was like the threshold ones. Okay, and um, continue the test on, still um, slight increases, not too much, not too bad. And then run about lactate turn point, there's another deflection point in blood lactate as the exercise and the intensity increases. And from there, then from those two points, then we, we can then establish uh, training zones so we can. And we can see here five zones that we um, established and we'll talk about them later on and how we categorize them. Basically zone one is recovery, zone two and three is steady state, where zone two is extensive aerobic work, zone three is intensive aerobic work, and then zone four is what you would call threshold work or turn point work. Now the difference between lactate threshold and lactate turn point is, lactate turn point used to be called the old anaerobic threshold, yeah, but physiologically it's incorrect because it's still along this whole curve, probably right up until here, the majority of the work is still all, are, all aerobic. So it's called lactate turn point right transition now is that your body can't clear the lactate quick enough, it's producing more than it can clear around those sp speeds of 20, 21 kilometers per hour. And zone 5 then is where you probably do your high intensity intervals. There is another zone, zone 6, where you go right up into speed endurance work. And that would probably be around 800 meters, 400 meters um, training. So, <coughs> just a tabular form of um, the results of this particular athlete. What we can see here, the physiological determinants um, analyzed. So we see a, is the person's VO2 peak is 67. Now, I must make a disclaimer here. Um, this athlete stopped the test at 22 kilometers an hour. He knew his body, he was quite happy because he just wanted that sub-maximal curve. Because he's a marathon runner, he wasn't really worried about going up to 8 and 9 millimoles. So he was, he just, this first test, he just wanted to see where he was at that sub-maximal level. So his peak, when we tested it again, his peak was, um, we stopped the test, we were doing 10, 15 minute recovery. We'd done a ramp test. This was on uh, about 8 weeks, uh, 6 weeks later, sorry. And his VO2 peak was 75. So that's just a wee disclaimer there. So the speed of LT1 based off his um, lactate is probably around about 17, 18 kilometers per hour. The speed of LTP was around about 19.8 to 20 kilometers per hour. And his fractional utilization, which is the amount of oxygen he utilizes at his LTP in comparison to his VO2 peak, was 90%. So again, that probably slightly high because his VO2 peak is probably high. So he, that could probably be done around about 85, 86, 88 percent, which is still really, really good. So it is. And then his velocity at VO2 was 21.9 kilometers an hour. So these are the, the main physiological determinants that you can analyze and you can um, take away from the lab profile. So <coughs> what does that tell us? So based off his um, lactate um, threshold, his LT1, uh, 
he could comfortably, in a lab setting, and that's where we need to be careful, Steve touched upon it earlier, this, these zones are just guides, they're not to be set in stone, because as coaches you will know much more about your athletes than I will, because I'll only be jumping into contact with them every two, three weeks or once a week, whereas these guys will be working with your athletes every day, so you'll be knowing what they're capable of and what they're not capable of. But Marathon, or sorry, possible marathon paces around about 18.4 to 19 kilometers per hour. Um, and then when you benchmark that against the world record paces around about 21 kilometers an hour. And that's not the, the hammer your athlete. That's just say there's where you are and there's where they are. So, so again, and with marathons and with times, things like that, distances, there is a lot of scope where you can make small improvements to improve your time. Number one is the right course, the right geography being um, number one. So what we then do is then, this is um, the data, we was lucky to share the data from a marathon that I completed in uh, during the last couple of months. And just basically the data downloaded off the watch, and the watches are fantastic, I'll touch upon it later on. So again, marathon might split times, uh, the green dice line is just basically the averages. Um, so it was, he averaged 510 minute mile pace. His average speed was 18.6 kilometers per hour. So it was, so gives us an indication. CLT1 was around about 18.4, 18.5. So again, it's good uh, agreement of where he was at his LT1 speed and where, he, where his average um, speed was throughout the, uh, the marathon. Now his average heart rate, was higher, was actually probably around about, if I go back, 10 beats per minute higher, 159, 160, and around about 170, and went up to 177, 170 towards the end. But this particular course, this particular race, it was a very hot day. So, so again, when you're planning for events and for races, you need to be careful of the external environment as well. And I'll just give you the, the heads up, Tokyo 2020 is going to be an absolute nightmare in terms of endurance athletes preparing for their events in Tokyo because it'll be 35 degrees, 70, 80 percent humidity, wet bulk, global temperature index if you make it around about 33, 34. So there's going to be a myriad of conditions there that's going to be really, really have a negative effect on your endurance athletes performances. So that's maybe something that two years out from now, interventions need to be put in place to make sure that any of your athletes that are going to Tokyo, <coughs> excuse me, need to be aware of and also to actually um, experience those conditions, whether it be in a heat chamber or somewhere else, that they can experience those horrible conditions. Because right away, if that's this athlete's normal pace, you can say that you won't take 20 seconds off that just based on the conditions. And a minute made pace. That's maybe a conservative um, estimate because they will not be able to sustain their normal race pace in those conditions. We've seen it uh, with the Scottish marathon runner out in the Commonwealth Games. And we've seen it in St. Stephen Seaward. Control the pace, conditions. He ran within himself, other lads were out, dizzy spells fell, and could have severely injured himself. So again, 18.61 in comparison to what we've talked about, 18.5 kilometers per hour for um, profile. And so once you profile your athletes, then it's up to it's not up to the physiologist. And what the physiologists do is just then prescribe and um, give a suggestion of training zones. We've seen it with the um, the five training zones. They're just a um, a guideline. It's up to then the coach to um, develop their individualized. Um, heart rate and pace training zones. And I'll also allow you working along those zones kind of like the structure training properly. So if you're going to eliminate bad practice, it's not going to be that fear of overtraining or burning your athlete out. So there's not so again using a lab based approach can help with your prescription in your training. <coughs> As we said going back to the curve, again you can work out specific training zones. So we can and you go, well, what does this mean uh, of animal training the LP? So, again, when you're working along these um, zones, 
specific adaptations take place as well. So Steve talk, touched upon it earlier with uh, capillary density, things like that. There. So if you're a marathon runner, then a lot of your work will be around here and maybe touching upon here. But what ideally what you want to do is shift this curve down and then to the right. So around here is a lot of high volume work. So there is so two hour runs, 90 minute runs. And that's where you then develop all your specific adaptations. So the next slide is just simple, like an endurance pyramid or a performance pyramid. Again, trends on one recovery based three hours plus. That was, and that goes not only just for running, but for cycling or any other endurance event, whatever lab test has taken place. That especially cross country skiers could do that on their, their ergometer. Cross country, out two, three hours. Bikes, cyclists are three, four hours. Recovery cycling around here. And again, the benefits that are getting down here is more oxygen delivery and the efficiency of oxygen exchange at the lungs and the muscles that will help them as they progress throughout their training zones. So you gain extensive aerobic, one to three hours, and again, the fuel source uh, continuum around here is mostly fat, some carbohydrates, and then as you increase the intensity, as you probably go through threshold, it's more of carbohydrate glycogen stores or your fuel source. So for endurance athletes, a lot of your trends are around here. So it is, we talk about um, fuel substrate use, fat oxidation is crucial for here to spur your glycogen and carbohydrate stores as you um, progress through the race. And again, just um, a guide of heart rate max is um, percentage of heart rate max, 60 to 75, is a pretty easy recovery steady state that Steve talked about even easing back in the recovery runs because there's still some adaptations taking place here. Now when you train around threshold to, uh, threshold pace, what tends to happen is then you're stressing that aerobic anaerobic transition zone. So again, there's an increase in what's called monocarboxylate transporters that allow you to clear the blood lactate um, away quickly. So once you um, train around here, that clears more of those MCT 1s and 4s in the system, clears the lactate quicker and then it allows you the, that curve to shift down into the right, which is what you're always looking for, that positive adaptation. And then just the respective blood lactate levels around those levels, around those training zones. <coughs> so you've got your lab test, um, you understand the training principles of your training zones and then you're prescribing a program. Yeah, this is just an outline of a, a program one of the athletes has been using for uh, a couple of weeks, four weeks again. Um, he's just come back, he wanted just to do a bit of easy running, run about LT1 with the additional stress of altitude. So they save his legs, but still stress the cardiovascular system. Again, same recession, 2,000 meters of altitude, four by 10 minutes, 18, 18 and a half, 18 and a half, 19. Um, second, on the Tuesday, then it's a track monitoring session. So, it is, so he's doing a specific session, whether it's 4 by 2 miles or 8 by 1 mile loops. And what he's doing then is analyzing lactate and heart rate. And that will be done maybe every three weeks to see if there's a change in his, um, his training, see if there's a change in his physiology. Again, Wednesday, easy run. Thursday, the same as Monday. Friday, long distance run. Saturday, easy run. Sunday's a long, long, medium pace. Okay, so what I would then suggest well, after six to eight weeks, come back to the lab and has there been any positive adaptations that take place? <coughs> so, excuse me, this is start of March, end of April. So, we can see at the end of each um, stage, we ask how hard you found that, and there's a scale that the athlete will read off. You can see on the red then the red lines are all just um, April results, blue lines are March results. So you can see here RPE is, uh, you see, found, he's found in each stage right up top. Basically every stage throughout the, the test, he's found it much easier, so he has, than the previous test. And when we look at the lactate comparison, no real change, no real significant change between 16, 17 K and R. But at 18, 19, and 20 k an hour is a significant drop in his blood lactate levels. And again, that reflects the specificity of his training over the last couple of weeks. So we're at over the last four to six weeks, just focusing on LT1 or just slightly above LT1. 
So he, was, he wasn't really worrying about going too much. Wouldn't go near 20, 21, 10, and he's focusing around that LT1 transition. So he wants to be able to run longer at that speed. While his lactates are st staying lower, so eventually then he, he, improves, he improves the marathon time. So minute ventilation is just the amount of oxygen taken in uh, per minute. And again, no real significant change up until 18 kilometers an hour, just a slight decrease. Um, relative VO2, um, slightly higher to start, maybe a wee bit of an efficiency here because you haven't really done too much tuning here. And again, 18 KMR, slightly lower, 19, 20, no real significant difference. And then we look at heart rate, there's no real significant difference in heart rate. But RER, which is um, respiratory exchange ratio, well, it gives us an indication of what fuel type that he's using. Not the, uh, not point eight um, to one is the carbohydrates, and anything over one is, or sorry, is fat, and then anything over one is um, gives an indication of carbohydrate use. So again, it's still here very efficient, he's utilizing a lot of his fat stores as fuel. But again, his RER is much lower. So it tell, and it will tell us it's more efficient that you use in fat as a fuel source rather than um, carbohydrates. So we've prescribed the training, the guys are out, we've done all the um, starting to do all the training. We're out there doing the six, eight, ten sessions per week. So it is so whose job or whose role is it to make sure that what they're doing, what is being prescribed, they're actually doing. So the target training versus actual training. And to also monitor, is the training prescribed relevant? Is it having a positive effect or is it having a detrimental effect? So <coughs> the importance of monitoring is it can provide an explanation of changes in performance. So it can. So if the guys are hitting He's doing three high intensity um, interval sessions a week and he's wondering why he's sore, he's stiff, his race pace has dropped, he's, he's not doing as well in races then. There's an issue there that can be flipped with that and looked at. There needs to be maybe a change in his um, change in the coach's training um, plan. So again, just provides more clarity and confidence and actually pinpointing the reasons for the changes in performance. But also allows you to look back at um, retrospectively, you say, to your low dose in relation to the relationship to your performance. So again, you're looking back, yes, we dropped our mileage down to 80, 80 miles this week, and we had a real good race, or we maintained our mileage up to 95, but we had a poor race. So again, it allows the, the coach and also the athlete to retrospectively reflect on what was good practice, what they found, Worked for their athlete, and hold on. I mean, we talk, Steve, and the other guys talk about how many mistakes they made with their athletes. So it's always important to have the data there to look at, rather than just working off the cuff. And say, ah, what was that? If you can look back at your training load data, then it can give you a clue of why you've done well or why you didn't, or why your athletes always injured or why they're not. And um, again, it will also enable appropriate planning, training loads and competition. Talk about if the, the loads are always too too high, it's having a, an adverse effect on performance competition, then that can be adjusted. And also then, <coughs> allows you to reduce the risk of injuries, illnesses, and uh, overreaching, overtraining in the athletes. But probably the most important thing is that it allows communication between the athlete and the coach and if there's a, a member or a, a support staff, such as a physiologist or a physiotherapist on board, and it facilitates that communication to ensure that the best possible uh, program is put together for the athlete health and performance. So, so it, again, that's probably for me the most important thing is to facilitate that communication between the athlete coach and the staff. So nowadays now, um, types of monitoring that are available. So everybody, we live in a time now where everything's all smartphones, watches, apps. So we're really lucky um, in comparison to years ago. We have the, the Garmin watches, the Pura watches. We just put the watch on, hit the button, and work for a run. We didn't have to wear a heart rate belt now. We have it all optical sensors on the wrist, which I don't think is, is totally accurate as what they're saying. 
So again, it can give you so much information. How long you run for, how many miles you've covered, what's your pace that you've covered, your heart rate, your max heart rate, your average heart rate, and some watches then also give you the actual amount of time that you spent in your heart rate training zones. All fantastic information. What we also can analyze, and Steve touched upon it earlier, is wellness monitoring. Again, having a chat with your athletes, how do you feel today, how do you feel every morning, can you rate your sleep out of 10, how hard did you find a session today? And the coach, I, if you ask the coach, I thought it was like 4 out of 10, but if you're asking your athletes, it was a 7 out of 10, and there's a mismatch there, then that needs to be picked up upon and communicated. Because if the coach is prescribing a session that he thinks is easy, but the athletes are finding it tough, then there's an issue. And it could, it, might be, it could be that they've had a poor sleep or they're feeling sore from the accumulation of the last couple of days. And then also, the likes of, um, if you have the, the financial resources, then you can conduct uh, lactate sessions at the track or at a park or wherever you do your, your tempo runs or your, your intervals. So there's so many types of um, monitoring that can take place. We're going to talk through a couple of them here and, and some of the examples that I'm going to talk about when I was away in, in Murthy with uh, some of the, the athletes. <coughs> so every day it was just, I didn't even have an app, it was just a piece of paper, every, all the athletes came down, they had their own individual daily diaries, and it was, once I came up, woke up, and down, gave me a sample to check the hydration before they go to training, to make sure that when they went out to training, they well hydrated. But all they had to do is um, answer six questions, every morning when they came down, and it was, okay, out of ten, how well did you sleep? Okay, one to two, five to four, three to four, per five to six okay, seven to eight good, nine to ten very good. Something of take less than thirty seconds. Some of them won't struggle with it, but most thought it was a GCSE marks paper. But then um, again just every day just how hard to find this or how how do you feel tired. And what we actually found is some of them sleep quality, sleep duration wasn't great the first couple of days. And we were, oh, what's up? What's, what's the matter? Oh the Ben men were at the front of the hotel, the Ben men were at a half five in the morning and they're making a racket. Right away, right, if that continues, can we ask the hotel to move into the back of it? And again, any just small details that you might not have, might have picked on, up on because you haven't asked your athlete, you haven't talked to your athlete. So things like that there can um, give you an indication of how your athletes are, first of all, responding to the training mode. Second of all, it could be something like stress. You may have had a <coughs> phone call, a fight with a family member, um, issues with studying exams, right, he's under pressure. Are you okay? Do you want to continue? Do you want to do this session? Or it could be, you know what, he's under pressure. He needs to go out to get his head, up, head away from the, the problems that he has at home or what he's having with his spouses or anything like that. It's just, again, that run on or that training session could be the release from that. So, <coughs> so this might not mean too much now. So basically, you get the, your six questions and it's marked out of 10 and the maximum score is 60. And then, so, whatever you get, 30 out of 60 is 50 percent, and then we can work out a wellness score, and we categorize them as green, very good, light green, very good, dark green, good, yellow, okay, amber, poor, red, very poor, and it gives us an indication of over longitudinal, we can look at individual athletes, longitudinal, that will say, right, hold on, he's struggling, and we can see here, two athletes, okay, and this was in Mercia, so after the days come in, come in the camp, he's struggling. What's wrong, okay? Oh, uh, had to get the flight out. I had to get up at four this morning, had to travel to the airport. The flight was delayed, got in. So right away, coming in, first of all, she's coming in off of um, poor sleep. So she says, he is so tired from the travel, stressed because there's been delays and she hadn't got the, the hotel in time, which should be. So, coach, probably maybe need to take that into consideration. Okay, it's tired, sore, right. We just adjust the training for the first day or two, just to make sure she's back up to speed. The second athlete coming in, okay, um, this is a marathon runner, so high volumes throughout the week, and then we can see, starting to get um, wellness scores dropping, feeling really sore, feeling tired, and. Still doing all his recovery, he's taking his naps in the afternoon, he's 
taken his um, recovery pumps in, he's eating well, but he's still um, feeling really poorly. And one of days, uh, the dead 33%, he actually take the training session off. Just don't take, take, take the day off the rest day. And uh, you see the next day again it's gone up. But that could be a number, number of factors. Is he training too hard? Is the load too high for him? If the load's too high for him, then is that a, a, a coach issue? Or has the coach prescribed sessions and has he done extra? So you need to be aware and that constant communication with your coach. Has he done what he's supposed to do? Or So before we blame the coach saying, oh, your sessions are too hard. Well, you've done an extra 12 miles this week. You know what I mean? Or an extra three. You've done an extra five miles coming in there. What you should be doing? So it's, also, it's just important as well to get the context around um, player wellness. Or sorry, not player wellness. Sorry, I do this with the footballers, and the footballers are normally up around about 80, 90%. But that's also a learning point for me. It could be that athletes, especially endurance athletes, that their wellness is normally around about 50, 60% because the training loads are that high. And let's be honest, who's ever heard of a healthy athlete? You know what I mean? <laughs> I know it's a bit of a paradox, but you know, they, they push themselves to the brink. Again, just weekly medics, how much have you done? How much were you prescribed by your coach and how much have you actually done? So again, these are just AM, mine is covered in the morning in red, and um, yellow, or sorry, green is <coughs> distance covered in the, in the evenings, <coughs> and your total distance that day. We are supposed to do 15 miles that day. And again, there's the day there where the guy was sick, had to take the day off. So again, because you have the watches and there's so many apps out there as well that you can upload your information, whether it's Porter Flow or whether it's iAthlete or iMonitor and that. So many apps that, or training peaks as Steve talked about, that you can get a picture over a weekly view or over a fortnightly view or a monthly view. And again, it's good to retrospectively look back to say, you know, maybe I've over-programmed a little bit too much there. So not only can you do distance covered in miles, but also difference in time spent in different pace zones. So again, now, if your LT1 work could be 5.15, but you find that your app is doing a lot of more work on 5.12, 5.10. So it needs to be managed there, as well as time spent in heart rate zones. So a lot of endurance athletes, 80 to 85 percent, and some guys are up 88 to 90 percent, so there's an issue there. <coughs> and then again, simple enough, how hard did you find your session? So I've prescribed the session to Jackie, Jackie. Yeah. Where it's, it's tempo already, I think um, it's a 3 out of 10 is moderate, and Jackie goes and does the session. She's the most tough, it's a 6 out of 10. Right, hold on, so there's a mismatch. As I said before, there's a mismatch. And again, we can then register longitudinally um, uh, analyze uh, training or just RP based. Basically, your session duration by how hard you found it. a 60 minute session, you found it 5, 300 units. And you can retrospectively, longitudinally look at um, the data to, ensure, to make sure that there's no issues uh, coming down on down the line. So again, one of the things we did with Mark there was we actually targeted certain sessions of the outfits, because whether it be a track session, a tempo session, to make to find out what they what they were actually prescribed. Did it actually correlate with a physiological response? So again, this particular session was a um, track session, 800, 600, 400 meter um, block times four, 90 seconds, 90 second rest between reps, three minutes rest between sets, and it was high intensity intervals. And the rationale for this by the coach was, well, this particular athlete's getting ready for a 5K road race a couple of weeks down the line, and we want to get her up to some real high intensity work to get the speed in her legs. Okay, so we see. Took the lactates at the, the last 400 of each block. Lactates are increasing from 8, 10, near enough up to 12 millimoles. So for me, then, that's a positive. That's, that's what the coach was looking for, and the athlete was able to deliver it. So again, athlete, uh, coach prescribed and was carried out. <coughs> Same athlete, a couple of days later. Um, Threshold type session, lactate turn point type session. So 
four to six millimoles is what the coach was looking for. Um, again, four K, three by four K blocks off of five forty um, time. Lactase nine, nine and a half, just uh, over eight. What would you say there? Anybody got an answer? Who would say? Was that? Would you think that's what the coach would have wanted? No. Yeah. So I would question that there. And again, when we look back at the athlete's wellness data, it's a bit sore, a bit tight. So again, and it was a pity was the coach was supposed to be out and couldn't make it. So again, that communication maybe was lost a wee bit there. But if, obviously, I'm certain not to blame the coach. If the coach had been there, then he could have said, hey, hold on, after the first, first block, we're going to maybe right, drop that back. That's, that's a bit too high, too hard for you. Um, again, track session, uh, two mile tempo plus 20 by 400, so up a 64 65 second block plus another two mile tempo. So for me, it was a threshold turn, uh, turn point type session and nailed it. He was able to cope with it, not a problem. So, <coughs> my time out in Murthia and working with the, the athletes over the last year is that it's important of monitoring your wellness metrics. So your sleep quality, your sleep, your or your sleep duration, how sore your athletes are feeling, how tired they are physically and mentally is um, just critical. And it's, it's and for me it's easy to say that because I'm coming in looking at it maybe a one week snap or snapshot or two week snapshot. I appreciate it's much difficult for for coaches who are maybe working a full time job, have a career, doing their own training, and maybe looking after six to ten athletes, it's really, really tough. So it could be something like setting up a WhatsApp. How are you okay? How do you feel? Yeah, good, plan. Right, any issues from tuning yesterday? No. Or as Steve said, we didn't know. Is anybody struggling with anything? Injuries, illnesses, how did you spend the session? Is any sessions harder than what you thought it would be? Um, so it's again, it's always about that communication. And again, Highlight the key sessions to be monitored and is the session plan with the right intensity. So we've seen there previously some of the um, sessions maybe were a wee bit too hard for the athlete and <coughs> can that be acted upon. And again, for me then, in Murphy it was great, I had a great time. There's a wee Chinese sweetie shop around the corner every night, got rid of the daily clock at night. We thought it was Christmas because we were 10 athletes coming in, I probably killed everybody's good habits and good behaviours, talk about behaviours, so every now and then get, let's get some sweets and sit around and watch the football and play cards. So um, if we can get more individual coaches at the camps, so I know it's tough when guys are working and they have their careers and their families and kids as well, but for me, as Steve and Jackie had pointed out, it's just sitting there, Chris was out that time as well, you're just sitting there and you're just chatting, you just, you spend, before you know, two, three hours have gone past and and for me, I've learned more there. I'm a physiologist, I'm not a coach, so I would, the amount of knowledge I would gain from that there that it makes me a better physiologist is you can't get that. As Steve says, it's, these, these are great, but it's just that personal insights of the coaches that really, really um, plug the gaps in your knowledge. And then obviously the coach athlete and practitioner relationship is critical. Again, I'm just a, I'm, not just a, I'm a practitioner coming into your environment. So first and foremost, I need to establish trust. I need to establish the mix of what. Does he actually think I'm good enough? You know what I mean? Does he think I'm worthy of coming into this group? And once I'm accepted, my, my place there is just to provide support to the coach and the athlete. It's not to dictate anything. It's just to say, right, here's, the, here's the data. Here's what we got from this particular training session. What do you think? Was, it, was that what you were looking for? <coughs> what do you think? They think maybe we're a bit too, and it's not to say, oh, you got this wrong, you should do this here, that's wrong, they're going to struggle. It's never about that because you try to do that, though, you're, listen, where you going, you're excellent. I've been doing this 20 years. So it's really important to um, develop the trust and also your own confidence to go into that uh, environment. So, it is. so basically, it's athlete centered, the coach leads it. And you're there scientifically to support it. That's the process to make sure you obviously my role is to make the coach look good, really good, but also make sure the athlete 
is help them fit and be able to carry out the coaches programme. So, any questions? Sorry for being so short. Got one question. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the adaptation to the percentage of fat burned for the, the example for the yeah. marathon run there, um, is that a result of just the pure block of training at those intensity yeah. and duration? Or is there any modification to nutrition bearing mind people advocating certain Oh, you then look hard yeah. or, yeah. or high fat diets. I think with this particular athlete, it's more that. Um, not totally known as, as nutrition habits, but he's never mentioned that he's on these mad, um, fierce, wacky diets where yeah. it's just all high fat and low carb. But with this athlete, is again, he's a very, very efficient runner. He's running economies world class. So it is so, because he's so economical, he uses less oxygen, and he uses less oxygen than his RER comes down. But it's obviously changed from something yeah. that was higher. And yeah. it, well, sorry, it was low in terms of yeah. that, and it's gone up. Yeah, but even at a starting point, the starting point was still very low. Right. So it was, but it's just got lower. I'll, I'll, make sorry, I'll just, just set, um, put a thought in. Well, <coughs> asking, not necessarily questions, but just thoughts. But uh, it, I was thinking as you were talking there, Ricky, and I think. Um, you know, the physiology, she bring the science, she bring the, you know, the, the knowledge of the science. And I think as coaches, we, we kind of have the art side of it. And, and sometimes it's the way though, then those messages are delivered to the athlete. The coach knows their athlete, so the coach knows how an athlete will take the information in and take it on board. And, and so I think that there is what, there's lots of reasons why it's important for the coach and the sports scientist to be working together. But I think... That, that's crucial and also the coach knows how the athlete's been training and what sessions they enjoy and what sessions they don't enjoy and so there's a, there's a lot of art I think in that as well in just trying to get the sessions right for the athlete by applying the science but just making sure it's right for that athlete. Just even on the, uh, the actual PXT, the, 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 um, the suggested training zones, that's just yeah. based off the sense of the, the lactate response yeah. but that's the sense part. Your coach and Steve alluded to it. Lactate turn points 18 or 19 and a half, but it, it's a tra it's a zone. It could be 18.7 to 19.5. So that's where the art of coaching comes in. Yourself, Mark or Steve or whoever, they know their efforts, and they'll know well if I give him <coughs> turn point 20k an hour, but if you're doing four 15 minute blocks at that hour, that could kill him. So there's no one. And what I have learned over the last year as well, and what we did include it in later. Um, Profiling sessions is that once we got to like 18 kilometers an hour, we went up in half a kilometer in increments. So on the test, we went to 18 and a half, 19, 19 and a half, 20, 20 and a half, 21. And again, it allows us to get much more of a better picture at those smaller um, details. So it's easy for me to say, ah, oh, yeah, you can run at 18 and a half, oh, we'll just jump up to 19, 19 kilometers an hour. But the coach will if he's run from 18 and a half to 19 kilometers an hour over an hour, two hours, it's going to kill him. Where I'm thinking, that's only half a kilometer an hour. The lactate tells me it's 1.9 or it's 1.8. Ah, he should be, he should be fine. But that's where the, the art of coaching comes in and knowing your, knowing your coaches. No way, yeah, listen. That's, that's telling me. That's just a guide. That's not set in stone. I will, I will use that to inform the coaching process and my, my, my prescription of my training. But that's not to say right. My athletes. 20k an hour, and we're going to 20k an hour because I know my athlete better than I know his. I also know mentally, and I give him six minute blocks of 20k an hour, he'll kill him. So, so things like that there, I picked up, um, again, one of the particular athletes I'm working with, he's very, very inquisitive, he's very, everything, boom, boom, 100 miles an hour, we'll do this, do that. And for me, I've learned so much from that there, I've learned so much from him, but also the same, right? Need to take a step back. Hey, you've changed your mind five times in the last three days. Here's so you need to be, be a, a, that enough for me to say. But Fast. Uh, Fast. <laughs> no, sorry. I'm just thinking. I'm just looking at the time. Yeah. and Thinking we might have to just hold some questions until later. Well, again, yeah. I was, if anybody's from down the lab, Kira's here. Says can't wait. It's going to bang out 23k an hour. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll go down to the lab, and if there's any questions. We'll get set up and then I'm sure we'll talk as we'll, we'll conduct the test. That thing over there, that thing over there, half is running 21 kilometers an hour. I don't put it.
Yeah. You two is only 55. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got one class economy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just want to take this thing. Pinky balance. Start at five minutes at eleven KNR, five minutes at twelve KNR, just a ten minute warm up. I'll take a wheel at the end of your twelve KNR and then we'll get you to jump off and put the mask on. So well and then you start to depend what your lactate is at twelve KNR and then start at thirteen. And then after you're just on for a three minute stages, so think of it as three minutes on, one minute off. So jogging for three, I'll count you in. You have worked it you yeah. work away and travel, so we'll practice that during the warm up. If you want to jump on there, yeah, the elevation is just half a percent. And let me know when you want to find out. Yeah. It won't be here until the funny thing can. Thank you. 
Pretty quickly. That's just normal. Okay. Okay. So we like this and drop them the one on the remote so that clear effect is the top of the So we'll call it the end mask. We'll put the end mask on the same head. I'll just hold that in there, yeah. We'll get this test of it, it's not going to match. Yeah. 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 Well, if I could just put your hand over the and blow it, no, yeah. perfect. Brilliant. Okay, if you just stand up on the treble. Yeah. What I'm going to do is let the treble run for a minute first. So if you just strum the treble inside the side, yeah. And then set the, the mask on. Now count in 3, 2, 1. Yeah. And you're on for 3 minutes. Yeah. 
170 for a marathon run on a big really, really high. Of course, in the nature of Kira's event, where she does a lot of field to high end work on her track sessions. So, this her left is 1.7. So, for me, I would say it's the first transition to jump above baseline levels. Notice on this, I'm keeping it for the moment. Yeah. Give what you find with 
there be more at one point Thank you. 
as pesquisas do processo do outro jogo na Journal Lab com o Fire Licença. Can anybody have any questions? Or? How many times in a year would you recommend it? Good question, yeah, very good question. Again, um, depending on the athlete, but you would maybe do this three times a year, four times max, it could be every three months. And again, the athletes might be away overseas, they might be having their camps overseas, they might be doing altitude camps, but warm weather camps. So what we try to do is get them off season, or start of, or sorry, start of just coming in the end of the pre season, mid season, and end season, and just see where they are at different end points of their training year. And then what you're probably always looking for is a natural progression year on year. So they're coming in the camp, but they're, they're down, but they're slightly higher than what they were last year. Down next year, but slightly higher. So it's that stepwise progression of, okay, we're still coming up off season, but um, I might have the same violence as I had mid season rather than yeah. the end of the season. Rather than coming back now, there's a big decrement, then it just lets us know that they haven't done as much work in the off season, haven't done anything to help themselves. And then that is then a lower starting point that they have to go from a lower base line. Is there, is there a recommended age you would start at this for? Sorry? Is there a recommended age you would start this kind of Um, we normally, well, we would have. We've had some of yours around 16, 17 years of age, so it is um, just to see where they're at. And what you find with young guys, the heart rates are sky high, because they're, first of all they're young, so their max heart rates maybe two and a thousand. They're running along at 170, at 13 k an hour, hold on, is everything okay? Well, it's, it's just um, it's just their physiology, whereas um, 170 for a marathon, I'm going to be asking ready to respond to what's here that 170 was fine because of the nature of our event. It's, it's a high intensity event. She's used to dealing with high lactate loads because she's used to walking again towards the end of her race as well. Speed and endurance work, tempo work in there, whereas marathons, all threshold stuff, all the rest of them, they're all about economy and efficiency. They're not even really worried about their view to peak. You know, and what you'll find is athletes that probably have higher view to peaks when they're younger. Few to maximum younger, but as they transition through the, the distances, you find that their view will, will, will drop because they're not continually stressing the high end work because they work with the groups on the capacity of the list. Okay, listen, okay. thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. All the very best. If there's any questions, uh, contact Jackie and any information. Right. 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 Right.